Hey everybody, thanks for joining me again to practice my CFI lesson plans with you. This next lesson is going to be on air medical factors. This is one of the technical subject areas in the PTS. So why do we need to know about air medical factors? Well, we want to be safe, right? We want to be safe pilots and there's there's numerous factors that can get in the way of safe flying. Healthy pilots and healthy passengers makes for a safe flight, a safe and happy flight, right? There's not, the pilot's not healthy, might not be able to fly the plane safely. So we're going to talk about hypoxia, hyperventilation, middle air and sinus problems, spatial disorientation, drugs and alcohol, motion sickness, carbon monoxide poisoning, fatigue and stress, dehydration, and nitrogen, and scuba diving. Alright, what's a medical certificate, and why is it important? Here's my medical certificate. You can see it there. My first class medical certificate. Every pilot needs to carry a medical certificate when they're acting as a pilot. Right? When they're flying a plane, you need to carry that with you. So that's issued after you see what's called an Aviation Medical Examiner, AME. Set up an appointment with them. They do a physical examination. Make sure you're in good health. And they'll issue a medical certificate. This can be a first class, second class, or third class, depending on the type of flying that you do. A student pilot should obtain one before they begin their training. Well, why is that? Well, it's a big commitment, right, of time and money for a student pilot. If they started their training, they got pretty far into their training, maybe they have got their commercial pilot certificate, and then they find out they can't get a first class medical for some reason, they can't go fly in the airlines, well, that's going to be a problem, isn't it, right? So, when I was a student pilot, I really wanted to make sure I could carry a first class medical certificate. I knew that I might need glasses, one of my eyes is a little blurry. So I wanted to make sure that I could obtain a first class medical before I even continued finished my private pilot and instrument training, right? So that's why it's important. We can find a list on the FAA website, we search for AMEs online, go to the FAA website, find an AME, call them up and make an appointment. Okay, so what if you have a medical deficiency? Can you still obtain a medical certificate? Well, it depends. There are certain medical conditions that unfortunately will not allow you to obtain a medical certificate, which means you won't be able to get a pilot certificate. You might not be able to get a pilot certificate, I should say. There's certain disqualifying conditions like diabetes, coronary heart disease, epilepsy, alcohol and drug dependence, and psychosis. Those are some examples. There's certain conditions that are acceptable. And you can obtain what's called a statement of demonstrated ability. Well, I have one of those as well. So what's this? this? Soda. Statement of Demonstrated Ability. So when I went to go get glasses, my, my right eye is a little bit blurry, right? Well, I'll go get glasses. Well, the eye doctor told me that my eyes were permanent that way. They weren't going to be able to be corrected to 20-20 vision. Well, that was scary, right? Because you need 20-20 vision to get a first-class medical. So I had to do some research and figure out that, well, I could obtain this. I had to do a medical flight test and prove that I could safely fly the airplane. I could see just fine, right? They issued me this, and they said I can carry first-class medical. So pretty cool. If you have any questions about things like that, such as I did, 
Ask your AME. Alright, hypoxia. What does that mean? Do you know what hypoxia is? Not enough oxygen, right? The brain is really vulnerable if it doesn't have oxygen. Even basic fun functions can become impossible. I've got a link here to a good video. There's plenty of them on YouTube where they put pilots in these hypobaric chambers and they take away the oxygen. Then they ask them to do basic things. One of them, they had this children's toy where you put the shapes, the blocks, inside the holes where they go, right? You have a triangle, a square. You put them in where you need to go. Well, after a few minutes of not having oxygen, these people couldn't even do these basic functions. They couldn't even identify what shape it was. They couldn't even put it where it, had, where it was supposed to go. So you can see how it can be really dangerous to not have enough oxygen. There's a few different types of, of hypoxia. Hypoxic hypoxia, a good example of this one. Well, if you climb to high altitudes, there's not enough pressure up there to keep the lungs pressurized to provide that oxygen that your body needs. Hypemic hypoxia, that's when the blood is unable to transport the oxygen to the cells. A good example of this one is carbon monoxide poisoning. What happens with carbon monoxide poisoning? Well, those that carbon monoxide attaches itself to the hemoglobin in the blood which doesn't allow the oxygen to attach itself. So, carbon monoxide poisoning can lead to hypemic hypoxia. Histotoxic hypoxia. Think of the word toxic for a second. Toxic meaning like poison, right? So, the inability of the body's cells to use the oxygen, although it might be being transported, right? A good example of this one would be like drugs and alcohol, that's poison to the body, might not allow um, the body to use oxygen. Stagnant hypoxia, stagnant, stagnant, what does that word mean? Not flowing, right? So what do you think stagnant hypoxia is? The blood is not flowing, that oxygen-rich blood is not flowing to certain areas in the body. Maybe there's a heart problem, or maybe the pilot's maneuvering under excessive g-forces. Symptoms of hypoxia. Well, what happens, right? If you don't have enough oxygen, you might get dizzy, lightheaded, you might feel numbness, you're vision might narrow, you might not be able to concentrate, cyanosis, you know what that is? Well, your fingertips start to turn blue. Impaired judgment. Even with all these symptoms, the pilot might not even be aware that they're experiencing hypoxia. Because of that euphoric feeling, they might feel like everything's fine and dandy. And it can be very, very dangerous. So, what do you do? If you're experiencing hypoxia, what do you do? Use oxygen, right? Hurry and descend to a lower altitude, right? You have no time to lose. If you're at 20,000 feet, you might have 30 minutes or more of consciousness, but as you climb, 30,000 feet, you only have 1 to 2 minutes. 40,000 feet, you only have about 15, 20 seconds. You have no time to lose. Hurry, use oxygen, descend. Do a rapid emergency descent. What are the types of hypoxia? Can you name them? Hypoxic. Hypemic. Histotoxic, stagnant. Good job. What do you do if you're feeling hypoxia, experiencing hypoxia? Use oxygen. Descend. 
Alright, hyperventilation. We're all familiar with this one. Excessive breathing. You might be panicking. You might be scared, nervous, right? Might cause you to hyperventilate. So what do you do, right? I've, we've all seen the brown paper bag. Excessive breathing causes a rapid loss of carbon dioxide. So, you need to restore those proper levels. Some symptoms might be a headache, dizziness, drowsiness, impaired judgment, clammy appearance, tingling sensation in the muscles, muscle spasms. The only difference is they're really similar symptoms to hypoxia, but you can kind of tell if someone's hyperventilating. They're breathing very rapidly. They need to, what do they need to do? Do you know? Besides the brown paper bag, you restore the proper levels of carbon dioxide in the body while you can breathe slower. Take some deep breaths, breathe slower, use a paper bag, talk out loud, and recovery is usually pretty rapid once the proper breathing is restored. That's hyperventilation. Alright, middle ear and sinus problems. Why is this an issue? You ever experienced pain? You ever had to Yawn equalizes pressure. Well, if that pressure inside the ear is not equal with the outside pressure, it can be very painful. It can even cause eardrum damage if there's excessive amounts. So, we have to equalize the pressure by opening what's called the eustachian tubes. If you're going on a road trip, you have to yawn frequently. Pop your ears, that's what I call it. You have to equalize that pressure, right? Well, during flight, when you climb, the outside pressure goes lower, and that inside pressure might be higher. You need to equalize that pressure, or the ear is going to bulge in and out. If you descend, to where there's higher pressure, there's lower pressure in there, that higher pressure is going to push inward on the air, it's going to be painful. So, chew gum, yawn, swallow, bounce off a maneuver, pinch your nose, close your mouth, and push outward. Breathe outward. Just enough to cause that pressure to equalize. Use caution during climbs and ascents. And, yeah, slow the rate if you're experiencing pain. Slow the descent rate. Sinus problems, kind of the same thing. We have sinuses here, here. You know, we have sinuses. We've all had a cold. We've all experienced sinus pressure and pain. Well, that pressure in the sinuses needs to equalize as well, just like the ears. So what do you do? Don't fly if you're feeling congestion. Slow your descent rates, allow pressure to slowly equalize and discontinue the flight. You don't want to experience the you don't want to experience that pain. So be safe, be careful, don't fly with congestion. Alright, what's spatial disorientation? Well, the body has different sensory organs which determine its position in space. We've got the eyes, the nerves or the postural system, and the vestibular system which is inside the ear. So we'll go over those. If those, don't, those usually work well together, but if they're not for a reason for some reason misleading signals misleading information will be sent to the brain 
So, what do the eyes do? If we're flying and it's clear skies, we can see for miles. We can see the horizon, we can see the clouds, we can see the ground, see everything that we need to see. The eyes are working properly, right? Well, what if we fly into the clouds, into IMC, Instrument Meteorological Conditions? Those visual cues are taken away, right? So misleading information is going to be sent to the brain. We have the postural system. A lot of people refer to this as seat of the pants flying, right? Fly by feel. Gravity, our body, has nerves and we can sense our position in relation to gravity. Well, during flight, Gravity might not be always working straight down. You might feel forces of gravity in different ways. Well, gravity is going to pull you one way, the plane flies another way. That's going to send misleading information to the brain as well. So that's the postural system. What about the vestibular system? Here's a diagram. We'll get into the details here. Basically, in the inner ear, inner ear, we have these organs, and it works in a very interesting way. On each of the axes is of, of rotation. You can see one, two, three canals, one, two, three pitch, roll, and yaw. So the semicircular canals, right? These three canals right here. They're at approximate right angles of each other. They're filled with what's called endolymph fluid. And that fluid is sent in motion with acceleration or other forces of motion. And that causes the cupola to move and there's tiny sensory hairs that detect movement. Autolith organs, they detect linear accelerations such as head changes, shift, you know, things like this. It's kind of what it looks like here. If you lean backward, those tilt backward, and you feel that sensation forward, but acceleration does the same thing. Deceleration does the same thing. So if you're in a really fast car or plane, you might feel like as you accelerate, you're leaning back a little bit. There's some good examples of illusions, such as the Lean's Coriolis illusion, Graveyard Spiral. Those are in the P-Hack Chapter 17. Okay, motion sickness. This is a common one. Some people experience it, some people don't. Well, what's motion sickness? Well, when these systems of the body are not working well together, they're sending misleading information to the brain, you can start to feel sick, right? Some people get this on a roller coaster, things like that. Some people are more prone to motion sickness. If you have a new student, student that's always feeling sick, maybe you can take it easy. Start with, start small, then you work your way up to steep turns and those types of maneuvers, because they'll slowly build up a tolerance. And yeah, if it happens, you can open the air vents, get some fresh air. Um, avoid unnecessary head movements and things like that. So some of the general symptoms, nausea, dizziness, discomfort, paleness, sweating, vomiting. Carbon monoxide poisoning. What is that and why is it bad? Well, carbon monoxide, can you smell it? No. Can you see it? No. Well, 
In the cabin, inside the plane, you have air ducts. And if there's a leak in the exhaust, it can send carbon monoxide into the cabin. We already said that the carbon monoxide attaches itself to the hemoglobin, doesn't allow oxygen to attach itself, and can lead to carbon monoxide poisoning. Some of the symptoms might feel lightheaded, a headache, drowsy, dizzy, lose coordination or muscle power. Well, what do you do? You're flying in the plane and you start to smell some exhaust. Well, you know that exhaust has carbon monoxide. So what do you want to do, right? You want to keep a detector handy. Some of them are disposable, they change color. You can have a portable one that might have an alarm. But if that happens, if you're getting an alert, or you smell that, open all the vents, descend, cancel the flight, get out of there. You know, it's very dangerous. Alright, fatigue. This is one we are familiar with, right? Fatigue. You feel tired. You feel exhausted. That's fatigue, right? There's two types of fatigue. Acute fatigue. That's like after a long days of work, a lot of hard studying. You feel drained. You feel tired. That's acute fatigue. Chronic fatigue is long term. Caused by certain diseases, physiological reasons, right? You might not have a good diet or very good habits and those kind of things need to be changed. It's like a lifestyle change and you might need to seek professional help. Acute fatigue can lead to chronic fatigue. So get enough sleep and, you know, eat healthy and do those things to avoid fatigue. Stress. Everyone's felt stress to some degree. Stress is the body's response to demands placed on it. Physiological or psychological demands. A little bit of stress can be good, right? Might allow you to focus on what you're doing. Perform, you know? When I have a check ride, it's like, I'm stressed, but sometimes you do your best flying when you're at when you're under those situations. So we have acute and chronic. Acute is that um, immediate threat feeling, like fl that fight or flight. It can be good, but too much can lead to chronic. Long-term stress. That's like, it presents an intolerable burden on the person. And they lose those feelings, they feel like they can't cope. Performance will fall rapidly. Don't fly if you're stressed. If you're very stressed, you need to seek professional help. Okay, dehydration, what is that? You should know. If you feel thirsty, you haven't had enough water, you might feel dehydrated. Critical loss of water from the body. What do you, what happens? What are the signs and symptoms? Headache, tired, maybe cramps, dizziness. So if you drink a lot of caffeine or soft drinks, um, things like that, you need to be careful. You need to drink plenty of water, two to four quarts every day. Keep a water bottle on you and stay on it, you know? Don't wait until you're really thirsty. Just stay hydrated throughout the day. Alright, let's talk about drugs and alcohol. Should be a no-brainer here, right? Don't drink and drive. Well, don't drink and fly. Don't do drugs and drive. Don't do drugs and fly. You know, it's a no-brainer. Even if you have a hangover, it can impair your judgment, your reaction time, your performance. Eight hours from bottle to throttle, right? That's in the regulations. 
and what percentage of blood alcohol content is allowable or what does it need to be at before you can act as a pilot. Point zero, four or less. Just don't do it. Don't fly after using drugs or alcohol. It can be really dangerous. Um, even medications, right? Whether it's over the counter or prescription, you need to talk to your medical examiner and find out are they okay, which ones might be acceptable, which ones aren't, and avoid the ones that aren't. For me, with allergies, you know, there's certain allergy medications that are fine and certain ones that might impair me of my flying skills, right? My judgment, my, my reaction time, things like that. So, always ask your AME. There's certain websites online, but you need to make sure it's coming from an FAA source. And if not, then just ask your AME, and they'll tell you. Alright, nitrogen and scuba diving. I've always wanted to go scuba diving, but I haven't. When a person does go scuba diving, they allow their body to go be put under large amounts of pressure, more than you do normally, right? Well, nitrogen is usually dissolved in the body fluids and tissues, and when you're put under that much pressure, there's more nitrogen present in the body. Um, so if you come up too fast, it might form tiny bubbles, and that's called the bends. It can lead to severe amounts of pain. If you get on an aircraft too soon after scuba diving, it can cause severe amounts of pain. So how long should you wait after you go scuba diving? Well, the recommendation is wait 24 hours if you fly above 8,000 feet or 12 hours if you fly below 8,000 feet. Just to make it easy on me, I like to just say, well, wait 24 hours after you go scuba diving. Alright, am I fit to fly? How do you know if you're okay? What's a good way to determine your fitness for flight? Well, I am safe. It's a checklist we can use for the pilot and the passengers. I am S-A-F-E. Can you name I am safe checklist? Without cheating here. <laughs> Illness, medication, stress, alcohol, fatigue, and emotion. Or some say eating with the E. Illness, right? Are you feeling ill? Feeling sick? Do you have a cold? Medication? What have you taken? Prescription or non-prescription? Is it going to affect you? Stress? Are you stressed out? Alcohol? When was the last drink? 8 hours from bottle to throttle. 0 0.04 or less. Fatigue? Did you get enough sleep? When's the last time you slept? How much? How many hours did you sleep? Any emotion? How how are you feeling emotionally? Are you mad? Sad? Feeling a little depressed? Those feelings are going to affect your flying. So use I am safe. Know I am safe. Use it every time before you fly. So let's review aeromedical factors. Pilots need to be healthy, right? You want to be a safe pilot, you got to be a healthy pilot. There's many factors which can get in the way of that, which we need to be aware of, such as hypoxia, hyperventilation, middle ear and sinus problems, and everything we just went over. So make sure to understand them and the risks involved. Use I'm safe often for the pilot and passengers. And yeah, that's our medical factors. Thanks for watching my lesson. See you on the next one.